Hey, this is Steve Zeltzer uh, with Workweek Radio, and I'm talking with Danny Glover, who is a well-renowned uh, actor and activist uh, here in the Bay Area and internationally. And tomorrow there's going to be a rally uh, against gentrification and against privatization of the Port of Oakland, and Danny is the keynote speaker. And what, what really is going on in Oakland, and why are you coming back to the Bay Area to, uh, to be at this rally in East Oakland, Danny? I'm, I'm actually coming home. <laughs> I haven't been home for, for like three weeks, you know, so I'm finally getting the chance to come home because uh, I've been on the road. I've been out of the country, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm coming home. I've always considered myself not simply a resident of San Francisco, but also I've considered myself a, a, a resident of the Bay Area. So the 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 impact of political decisions that affect San Francisco also affect the rest of the Bay Area. Economic situations affect affect San Francisco have a residual effect on on the rest of the Bay Area. And I, I'm concerned that about the gentrification that I've seen in in, in Oakland, uh, certainly and and certainly in San Francisco, where the population of African Americans when I grew up was 12 percent, now it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 4 percent. So I'm concerned about that, you know, because I think I think that that, that that what governor's responsibility is, is to look out for those who are the most vulnerable in the situation. I remember working in, in, with Waco, in Waco, going to Waco meetings, Western Edition Community Organization meetings in 1966. And going to those meetings at 20 years old, and seeing how the community mo- mobil- was mobilizing against redevelopment, which is referred in the 20th century is referred to it was that form of gentrification, but redevelopment, and how how they were organized against this what was happening. They were always the same thing: if jobs are going to be created, you know, there's affordable houses. Uh, in, in fact, they were able to use those who, who struggled in those movements were able to use uh, ta- the tax incentives, you know, that were available by the federal government for people who who invested in, in, in affordable housing. You know, those things are certainly a, a, were, were were things that were part of uh, the great society and 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 the war on poverty, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those things are not available anymore. So we're pushed out of there, out of the, uh, out of the central, uh, uh, the the center of political activity on the outskirts of political activity. You know, as this whole wave of privatization, this whole wave of corporate interest, uh, this 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 uh, this whole process that is going on, and not only in San Francisco but other places as well around the country, whether it's over the Rhine in Cincinnati, whether it's in Harlem, and all the places where working class people, and I should use that networking, they're working class people. You know, they were part of the industrial industrial workforce and they, and continue to be a part of the industrial workforce. And they pushed out pushed out of the decision-making process that, it hap- that is happening around the uh, 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 cities in the country. And also, uh, this uh, is involved in ethnic uh, cleansing. Uh, a lot of African-American, Latino people are being driven out of San Francisco. It's becoming a white city. Uh, do you fear the same uh, situation in Oakland, which has historically been a black city? West Oakland, black community now has been driven out. Uh, I mean, it's uh, uh, part of it is, is the effect on the African-American, Latino communities. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 hate, I hate to use the word ethnic cleansing, you know, and it's not, that's not what she, I, I want to think about it from that vantage point, uh, and because that's very stark, and, and then has other connotations as well, you know, we watch real ethnic cleansing in places and have, 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 uh, have uh, in some sense, lived through those moments as, in, in, as well. But I'd like to, to think of, uh, about the kind, because, what is what the process is? What is the process that is generated by a kind of cultural shift, you know, and and that cultural shift of consumption that Dr. King warned about? Two things he warned about: racism, militarism, and materialism. That cultural shift, which is magnified in the kind of uh, uh, 
cultural attitudes we have are dictated by the technology that we have in our, our hands. We all walk around with a tel- cell phone, but that cell phone does not empower us as if it it, 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 it it seems to be the propaganda behind it is that it does. But with the cultural shift that people don't 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 understand ramification. And there's a desperate desperate need for for some sort of validation within this cultural shift. Now I'm talking about from my own vantage point, because I've lived in the same city all my life, you know. Uh, but there's there's a kind of uh, these these houses that, that my parents bought my first house, my the house, first house that I lived in, that they were uh, own homeowners, or at least they were paying a mortgage on it. They didn't own it, but they were paying a mortgage on it. Was when I was 11 years old. Before then, I had lived in housing projects in Hunters Point, in, in on the Army Street pro- uh, projects on Third and Army when they were there, and up in the projects and on 19th Street just below uh, Betrayal Hill. Those are the housing projects that I lived in until my parents were able to, to scratch together enough money being per, well, postal employees, and, and they were able to scratch together enough money, put together enough money to make a down payment on the house, which, which I live 12 blocks from now. It was on the right at the, on, on, at the Haight, in the Haight-Ashbury, and I live 12 blocks from there right now. So, so I, I'm, I'm saying there's something else much, much, much deeper in, in, in the, in this kind of uh, system where, where, and 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 I I can have my own economic thoughts on it, and what are the forces that are driving that? Where hedge funds are buying up homes and holding those homes and using those, using that as a platform in in order to uh, profit their their members of their hedge cl- hedge funds and everything else. All this thing is going on behind us. So ordinary people who usually save up about 20% in which they put on a house of uh, uh, fighting with people who come who come with full cash whether they that mo- where that money comes from uh some of it has come from the limited investment opportunities in the world perhaps because of the, all the conflicts that are in the world, nobody's going to invest in in anything in Syria night right now. Nobody's going to invest in anything in Iraq or any place else like that where the conflicts or places where money may be shifted. So it shifts here. You can see the same problem happening in London. You know, where people will fit, fit, putting their money where they feel that is a safe haven for them to invest their money. And so that's the that's the that that reality is happening. How did it affect San Francisco? How did it, how did it affect places like uh, in Canada, like Vancouver? You know, and Vancouver. When I first came to Vancouver in nineteen nineteen eighty three, and to make a film, it's a totally different uh, city now than it was in nineteen eighty three. It's been taken over by uh, bad wealth and prop and people who are are. are uh, have, have have resources in order that they they are, 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 are profiteering off of off of these the, the crisis that we have in housing. You know, that if you have seven billion people on the planet, you're going to have to find some way out to house them. And we're talking with Danny Glover about a rally he's going to be attending on gentrification in Oakland and the privatization of the Port of Oakland, which threatens maritime jobs. And John Fisher, who is uh, one of the owners of The Gap, his family owns The Gap Corporation, and he operates uh, the charter school chain KIPP and Rocket Ship, uh, tried to get some land at Laney College uh, for a stadium that was uh, rejected by the community who were fearful of gentrification and the destruction of their homes. But now he says he's going to help develop uh, West Oakland with a uh, a new stadium, new A stadium in West Oakland on the Port of Oakland Howard Terminal, and also build four thousand, uh, likely one million dollar condos. Uh, what would the effect of uh, that stadium be on the people of Oakland, in your opinion, Danny? Well, it's going to have a devastating effect on. It. It's going to have a devastating work uh, effect on those who work uh, in the maritime industry, uh, longshoremen, and those people who have ancillary jobs that are connected to it. It's, it's going. It's going to affect with that 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 Howard Terminal, which is a major throughway for tra- the traffic of goods and service by ship shipping from around the world. Uh, it's probably the it, and not probably it is the largest. Uh, 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 the largest uh, place of, of where ships 
that landing in, in, in the, in, on, the, on the West Coast. So it's, it's going to have a major effect on that. But what's happening in West Oakland is connected to what is happening in San Francisco. What's happening in Oakland is intricately tied to what is happening in San Francisco. So uh, normally the places for, for, for affordable housing was, uh, and access to the city for poor people and working people was West Oakland. They had jobs and those who were in certain industrial jobs, blue collar jobs and everything. And normally they would live in West Oakland and be able to have access to San Francisco. But now, with the overflow of people who are migrating to San Francisco to work in the tech industry, those places, uh, they often refer to West Oakland as San Francisco East. You know, so all these are realities that are facing that. Now, what it was about, what was it about interesting when nobody, be, nobody wanted those houses in West Oakland? They sat vacant at that particular point in time. We had gone through the, the, the war on drugs and, and crack cocaine and everything else, and you saw the residual that fa- effect in West Oakland all the time. In, in, in those public spaces, you saw where with men and women who were trapped in that, in that environment could not, could not, in some sense, could, and could not free themselves from that environment, they, they inhabited those places. They were renters. Their parents may have been homeowners. You know, that, you know, a one one of the scenarios, and so certainly that was a scenario in the last black and Sa- black man in San Francisco, was the loss of the home, a house, and the loss with the loss of the home was the loss of identity. And so we can see the story that replays itself. That same story in the film replays itself all through the, the late seventies, eighties, and all that period where the the introduction and heavy heavy uh uh. Uh, the heavy in, 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 in incarceration and and the heaviness of what happened with crack crack cocaine, all those things here. Nobody thinks about that now. <clears throat> now I I bought my my first house in, in San Francisco when I was working for the Office of Community Development in the Model Cities program. I bought the house in, just before my 29th birthday in 1975. And I bought a house down that I live in, so which I've had that house. I've owned, had ownership of the house for 44 years. The house I live in is 12 blocks from where I grew up on, on Central and Fell. And I bought that house then because it was affordable. I had a job. I had had service on, when I bought it in 75, 1975. I had been with the city for four years so I can get a, I can get a loan and everything else on that block. The, on that block were four black families already. Well, four, uh, three of those families, three of those families worked at the post office, including that, including, and knew my parents who worked at, as postal employees and who were part of the union. As 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 workers at at, uh, at at the United States Postal Postal Service. So all this, this the, all these things, they've been clear for for people who are working people that they're the ones who are most vulnerable, vulnerable, and they were the ones who are going to displace by this this whole thing. They consistently and whatever promises that are going to be made about affordable housing and that thing, there, the idea that some unions are supporting it. Those unions supported it because, one, the initiative because it creates jobs. Well, it would be great if they would have elected or, or, or fight for in, 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 in this electoral process, putting those people in, in place who are going to cre- create jobs who go from, from expanding, uh, uh, from expansion through you know, infrastructure revitalization and other jobs. There are other ways to create jobs, but to remove it, it's, it's, it's stupid. To create these jobs, in, in in a sense, and at the same time, knowing the and the impact that it's going to have on the racial demographics and and the the income demographics in West Oakland is ludicrous, also, unconscionable. You also have thousands of people who are living in tents uh, in Oakland now, 
Exactly. Uh, they have no place There's to go. There's no plan for them. And, exactly. And it seems like the priority of, of Libby Schaaf, the Democratic Party, Nancy Skinner, uh, Ron Bonta, uh, is to make it easier to build a stadium. Why isn't there working class public housing being built in Oakland for working people? That, and that, the poor? That, 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 that's the question. That is the question. You know, I mean, we saw we saw we saw in San Francisco some sort of limited place to 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 build something uh, around uh, where where the uh, McDonald's was on on stand you between hate and and Waller, but nothing has happened to it. It sat, sat there and continues to sit there. So all these kind of these kind of uh, projects in some sense to placate people or to uh, or to any sense to uh, to disrupt the momentum of, of outrage among public pub, in the public space among citizens is what's happening here. There's always this kind of I, we saw it in, in Western Edition community uh, development. We know that that the, the first thing that, that they said about this is and this was in right after the war in the late early 50s. The crime levels in those places were primarily people of color of African Americans versus the crime level. It never talks about the people who went to work every day who found affordable housing in there, and some of them had been there. Uh, after come to that to San Francisco, before and after the internment of Japanese who were ruled from their house, so we see all this kind of thing play out in a different kind of scenario. We're always marginalized and temporary in the spaces we are until capital or investment opportunities of of, of real estate developers decide that this place is the place that's going to be the one in which profits can be. Uh, and amazing and, and, and all those things and made and everything else, then we're expendable in that sense. And on to another subject, and that is the effort to destroy the Victor Arnertoff mural at Washington High um, and the campaign that is being waged to say that it's traumatic. Now, you went to Washington High as a student, and what do you think about this whole uh, campaign to destroy the Victor Arnertoff murals at Washington High? And I, I, said, I said, when... As 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 I I've seen use use Baldwin's statement when Baldwin said when we cannot tell the truth tell ourselves the truth about our past we become trapped in it. This country's problem from every aspect, of it, no matter how it p- p- positions itself, it it cannot it cannot it does not have the capacity to tell the truth about our, our past to make that the, the 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 most resonant part of our healing, not only the healing of those who are the descendants of who suffered through our our horrific past, you know, whether they're slaves or whether they're First Nation people. So that 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 what that that mural which sits up there at a school where forty nine percent and this is the reality, forty nine percent of the students in that school of age and descent and that and, and the, the idea that the teachers association who's supposed to be advocating learning and what are the base, what are the most profound ways in which and for credit ways in which you can learn is through art you know are going to destroy something I mean, that, that's been there and been a part of that school i said from the moment that it was built almost i don't know when, when it was built 1936 uh, from, 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 from the moment that that school was built now you had a strong working class movement at that particular point in time. You had a, a, a moment because of the depression before and during the New Deal where there's a, a, an extraordinary level of radicalism and radical thought. You can't, you can't arrive. That painting may not have been painted at any point in time post the depression. At any point in time, because at that particular point in time, capital felt com- comfortable with its new relationship with labor and, and on a number of other things. Happened. So that painting may not have been painted, but it was painted right there at that moment. You know, I mean, it, it's, 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 I'm not saying I'm not judging what his his status is, as an artist is. You know, if, if, if he, he's not a, perhaps not equivalent to some of the artists that are renowned. You know, but there were paintings that were done by Picasso. There were, there were paintings done by uh, Diego Rivera. There were paintings, all these paintings that were done by people who had 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 a, had a, a narrative, another different narrative, 
and a radical narrative about how the world should be. And at this particular moment, given all the all the all of the the uh, from from uh, uh, at this moment to have this have this covered up or, or destroyed in a destroy. <laughs> It's like, and as I said, and others have said, it's like burning books. And yet, in San Francisco, 320 public school teachers signed a petition supporting the destruction of the mural. How do you figure that, Danny? What is going on? I, um, I well, there's a major problem, I think, when we have in terms of where's San Francisco in terms of, on, on, in terms of the, the, the country, in terms of education. Where is it? It's at the bottom. It is not at the top as it was when I was going to school. When 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 I when I when I was going to school, the teachers who migrated to San Francisco, who became reaccredited, were already teachers. You know, some of them were already teachers. They they came to San Francisco for a better life and more opportunities, and they re- became reaccredited for uh, to to become teachers to teach in San Francisco schools. That is what the the the, the whole. The whole teaching profession has been deep professionalized. The whole teaching, and it's happening all around the all around the country, you know. But this is not the same neighborhood that that was uh, at, 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 in 1964 when I graduated from that. And 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 you would think certainly it was not the same neighborhood when uh, and the same kind of verb and temperament. In, in the in the sixties, when you had one of the most profound cultural movements in the twentieth century that happened in Haight Ashbury in, in in San Francisco, that's what San, San Francisco got its sense of itself being what is it called? Not the West Coast, but the Left Coast. So all of that history is not the same history when Harry Bridges in nineteen in the nineteen thirty four strike went through all the, the churches in 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 San Francisco and Oakland by boat primarily and told them not to be scabs on that on that strike and when we and it, and it, sh- it, sh- it shut down the port all up and down the west coast but it's not the same same place and same time and same history that's when that painting was painting that's in the context that this painting was made and many of those people who are calling for the destruction aren't really even aware of Victor Arnatov, that he worked under Diego Rivera, and it came out of a general strike, and I agree with you, that painting would not have been done, that mosaic would not have been done if there hadn't been a general strike and a mass movement of the working class in San Francisco. Uh, uh, Of course it wouldn't have been. You know, this country was on the verge of of figuring out whether it was going to have a military takeover, military dictatorship, or come up with the most, probably at that time, in some ways, some of the most audacious plans uh, since the, you know, the the, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, Civil War, and the, the Reconstructive Period. Today, uh, today, with growing rise of fascism, uh, racist attacks, uh, Trump inciting uh, racism against African Americans, against Latinos, the move towards uh, dictatorship, there there is no mass movement in the working class. Do you see a development of a work, work, mass working class movement in this country against these kind of attacks uh, economic and political tax uh, that are going on in this country, which uh, are are creating a great deal of fear in, in the working class and among uh, African American Latinos, minorities, Asians. Um, well, certainly there's, a, there's been a response for it, and and certainly it it is it is it, there's a lot of there's a great deal of work we have to do, but there's there's a growing response for it as well. Well, Sarah yeah. Nelson, who is president of the airline flight attendants, when uh, Trump shut down the government, said that we need a general strike uh, against this attack by all working people, against all the attacks on, on working people around the country. And uh, Bruce Nelson, who's vice president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, has said we need a general strike against the uh, attack on the climate uh, to, to defend the climate. Do you see these uh, calls as some kind of indication that working people are beginning to realize that they face a an uh, 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 attack which requires a real mobilization similar to the 1930s. Well, I I, I think this is I, I think this is a moment a, a moment of truth. I mean, I think there's a possibility of that of creating sustainable activism, and it has to be sustainable sustainable activism around this issue. We have to do something about climate. You know, what brings us home to us, however we get to it, no matter what we think 
or whatever we want, feel, uh, uh, how we feel about it. Something is happening in Arizona, a, a, a forest, rainforest that is affecting the planet and will and continue to affect the planet. You know, even when you see, even when you see uh, on the front page, full front page of yesterday's uh, uh, USA Today, which is no friend to progressive movements or movements, uh, the movements that are, are obvious, and, and you see on the front page where you see. The climate, something about the Amazon rainforest, you know. Now, now, it, it, it's it's very it, it, it's very interesting that it's on USA Today because it offers offers uh, a, 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 a perhaps what we think is a an opportunity, but it all, also has a way, could in some ways, of, of neutralizing or derailing the movement as well. So uh, that that is that is obvious. It is clear. It has been going on from from those people who were clients, climate scientists, those who were activists from the moment Naomi Klein to Bill McKibben and so many other people who are on the rise. It's going. It's happening in other places in the world as well. It's, it's noted by uh, uh, um, uh, Naomi Klein's book. This changes everything. So there's there's a whole bunch of there's, there's a great deal. Where does it take us? Is the moment. Where does it and and and, and the qu- the question it still rises, to, you know, Steve. To where can we do enough at this particular point, you know, or do we tinker with this 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 on the pref and be on the preface of of just the, the, I think the greatest outside of nuclear water, greatest existential danger in in, in, in my lifetime. And of course, uh, these companies, the energy companies, the utilities, they want to uh, make more profits regardless of uh, the cost uh-huh. of the climate. And you just returned from Ghana, from Africa. How is Africa being affected uh, by this climate crisis and, and their lives and their workers and their environment? Well, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, in the global south, and certainly people of color are going to be, the, the, you know, the first targets, the main, the main, the main, uh, uh, the, the ones who's going to affect initially. Uh, in those cases, because then they don't have the resources to respond for it. Whether it's Puerto Rico, and we see what what is happening, what has happened with Puerto Rico, uh, or whether it's Mozambique, which was was I was supposed to go to Mozambique earlier this year, uh, but it had these massive floods. But there's there's been a a a a, a city for some time in about 2,000 uh, kilometers. kilometers North of Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, on the Isle of Mozambique, near the Isle of Mozambique, the Isle of Mozambique, where they're planning uh, not how we to reverse what is happening, but how do we evacuate? So this is this is all happening all the world. We're not knowledgeable of it. You know, whole communities are figuring out, trying to figure out how do we evacuate. You know, so it's it's almost like in in the sense the destabilization that has taken place due to conflicts, internal conflicts within countries, and those those internal conflicts exasperating into the destruction of countries and destruction of, 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 the, of civil society to some extent in those particular countries. Imagine what the impact that's going to be on, on climate change and it's going to, in terms of climate change and who are the ones that are going to be enough along the ball. That's happening over there. I don't know to what degree... The discussion is uh, in West Africa. I don't know what to what degree the discussion is among uh, in the AU, the African Union. I know at Copenhagen in 2011, uh, Bishop uh, Bishop Tutu said, if you allow uh, the client, uh, allow the temperature to rise to two 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 uh, two uh, percent Celsius, that is going to insinuate Africa. Now it may be in that sense quite a big statement and maybe some hyperbola. I don't know around that, but but certainly he understood clearly, and most most people who understood clearly, because see we this is clearly that is going to affect those places in the global south uh, initially. Those are the places that are going to affect whether the global south, whether it's Latin America as we see Brazil now, or whether it's Bolivia, uh, all those all those countries that are on the border of the Amazon. Uh, Amazon rainforest is going to affect all of them. So, yeah. Now, 50% or more of young people in the United States now look to socialism as a solution to their future. They don't see 
uh, capitalism is a viable way of them surviving. Uh, is there a growth of socialism in the United States? Why do you think young people look to socialism as a solution to their problems? Well, you know, you know Steve, I, I did a narration on uh, just recently, it's going to air the PBS of uh, a documentary on Eugene Debs. I think one of the one of the most extraordinary labor leaders in the early part of the 20th century, and uh, and uh, or you, you can you can you can put Harry Bridges, another Australian socialist, who was there. I I I I, I hear that uh, uh, a, a a world that uh, that translates itself. Within, within the f- a framework of technology, uh, those who have access to it and those who have the power to influence by virtue of that access to it. Uh, and there's so many things that you, that you can't. You have, we have to talk about that and think about that, you know, because what does it look like in, 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 the, in, in its particular moment? Whether, whether it's a translation into democratic socialism, you know, which, which, um, you know, which Bernie Sanders may, may say, well, you know, FDR was a democratic socialist, you know, or whether, or, or in the sense that uh, Hugo Chavez was a democratic socialist, you know, uh, in, in that sense. I don't know. Um, uh, but it, it is, if, if, if it is indeed something that is now in, 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 the, in, the, in the bowels of, uh, of, of young people right here, let, let's see how that translates into the kind of systems that we, we desperately need. And, um, and, you know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks for joining us on Workweek Radio, and <laughs> obviously this, this discussion goes on and on and on. So, Well, it, it goes on and on and on, you know. All, all of us who, you know, who, who understood clearly when, when Dr. King organized that Poor People's March, and came, first came out in, in 1967 with his speech at, at Riverside Church beyond Vietnam, and begin to shape shape a, a relationship between poverty, war, materialism, which is very profound at the beginning of this, at, at the early stage of this process, and and begin to organize the Poor People's March, which Reverend Barbara uh, and, uh, uh, and last year uh, uh, brought brought into uh, a, a brought into existence again as as a legacy, part of the legacy to. To Dr. King and the necessity of it itself, you know, despite all the technology, despite all the dreams we have had, that, that, that moment brought us into the, the next phase of, of this new technology more than 50 years ago. The gig and, economy. and having it yeah. part of, of, of our public discourse and a part of our accessibility in different, different ways. How do we use that? Building the society and building a society that works for all of us. Trying to talk about that and deal yeah. with that in some so many different ways. And 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 some of those those uh extraordinary people who were brought to power in Latin America, you know, all of the things that we I don't they cannot be just a part of memory lane for us. They have to they have to translate it into something that transforms this uh, this country. And by transforming this country, its impact on the the rest of the world is 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 even more evident. And you were a, uh, an activist at San Francisco State, which is fifty years ago, fiftieth anniversary. What is the yeah. relevance of the San Francisco State strike for today uh, in working people and students and and the young? Uh, what was the relevance of that strike for today? Well, the, the, the relevance let's forget the relevance was that it brought together community. It it it, it is, is the action the and it, and it was a radical idea. It's in every sense it telling the story of those people, and and making and and creating this school of ethnic studies, uh, which I thought was I felt was a radical idea. Well, you can discuss not only the moments that in its in its purpose and its thing else it was this state. I think I think in some sense was destabilized 
by so many things that happened, the de-radicalization of universities around the country was a part of that. And that in itself was a deliberate action, an attack to get all those radicals out of there. Those radicals, remember, came through the civil rights movement. They came through women's rights movement. They came through the rights for First Nation people. They came for the rights of, of, of Hispanic people. Those ra- that radicalization was a part of that. It, it's part, part, part of, of, of and, and it's, if we have to find ways, and we have not found ways in terms of connecting that to, to the, that period, that period during the first part of, prior to World War II, probably the, uh, the rad- most radical moment in this country's history. That first 40 years of the century. And, of course, today the students have to pay thousands of dollars. They're in debt, 50, exactly. 60,000. Privatization, public education. Okay, well, I want All to right. thank you for joining us. We, thank you. Thanks for joining okay, us. Okay, bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.